Hello and welcome. This is Reverend Folklore from a band Insomniac Folklore. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the painter John Martin and how he has influenced me as an artist and a musician. So, here we go. <laughs> John Martin was a painter who was best known for his apocalyptic landscapes, uh, often depicting biblical, historical, and mythological events. John Martin was born in 1789 in a one-room cottage in England. Martin had three older brothers, one who was an inventor, one was a tanner who became a military general who fought in the Battle of Waterloo. One was a priest who eventually went mad and tried to burn down a cathedral. John's father, Fenwick Martin, placed him under an apprenticeship of a coach builder to learn the heraldic painting style, um, which is essentially designs for banners, crests, uh, just designs that signified rank or pedigree. Uh, after a dispute over wages, um, John was placed under a new apprenticeship with an Italian painter. Uh, John Martin moved to London and was married at age 19 to his wife Susan, who was nine years older than him. They eventually had six children together, and in those early days, John made a living teaching drawing lessons and also painting designs on glassware and china. After a few attempts at submitting his work, his first painting was finally hung in 1811. Critics praised his worksmanship and eye for detail, but he was still unable to sell his work. His first break came in 1812 with the painting In Search of the Waters of Oblivion, which was hung at the Royal Academy and ultimately ignored. He was asked to take the painting down and took it home. Uh, a while after getting home, he received a note from who would be his first patron who wanted to purchase the painting. In Search of the Waters of Oblivion would be his first work to sell, and many more would come. On a personal note, I will add that this is the only painting of John Martin's that I've seen in person. Uh, I've seen it hanging at the St. Louis Art Museum, and I have gone back there many times over the years just to, just to look at this painting. Um, I also picked up a postcard of this painting that I have hanging on the wall next to my desk over here. Shortly after his first success as an artist, uh, John came upon some major setbacks. His father, mother, grandmother, and his young son all passed away in the same year. It took him nearly four years to get back on track of his career as a painter, and during this time, he supplemented his income by helping his brother with sketches of his inventions and ideas. He returned to work in 1816 with a string of successful paintings, and his career really started to take off during this time. 5,000 people paid to see his painting, Belshazzar's Feast. His quote about that painting is, It shall make more noise than any picture ever did before. Only don't tell anyone I said so. Later, that painting was nearly destroyed when the carriage transporting it was struck by a train. Noisy. One of Martin's best-known works is perhaps the 24 engravings he was commissioned to make for a new edition of Milton's Paradise Lost. You see these floating around once in a while, and maybe you've seen these without knowing who John Martin was. John Martin himself was a devout Christian. Um, he was also a defender of the deist point of view, which I'm personally not the biggest fan of, and he was a believer in what he referred to as natural religion. The Martin family had many eccentric friends which they'd frequently have over for evening parties. One young lady which they took in was a writer. Her name was Jane Webb, and she wrote The Mummy. Several Hollywood movies would take vague inspiration from a story she wrote. Um, it was a story about a resurrected mummy who was in a high-technology, electricity, and steam-powered world. Another friend who had come over to these dinner parties was Charles Weststone, a physics professor who 
was also the inventor of a concertina, which he would frequently bring to parties. There is also a young admirer of John Martin's work, which would frequently come to the parties, named John Tenniel, who would later become known for his illustrations in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. John would wind up taking several years off from painting to work on inventions and civic planning. He worked a lot on trying to improve London's sewer system and general drainage issues. Uh, during this time, his brother, who was a nonconformist priest, wound up setting fire to a church. And for this occurrence, John was made to testify, which gave him a lot of not necessarily desirable attention. Also, John was dealing with a lot of grief during this time over the suicide of a nephew, and all of this compounded on a season of several years of heavy depression. John began recovering from this and went back to work in 1839, and had a lot of success exhibiting his works throughout the 1840s. He spent the last four years of his life working on a trilogy of biblically inspired paintings, which I think are some of the best works of his whole career. He completed these paintings in 1853, and soon after suffered from a stroke, which he never recovered from. He wound up passing away in February of the next year and died in 1854. There's a lot I skimmed over here. These are just the bullet points of a man's life. But what a body of work he left behind. All throughout the writing and recording process of our album, Everything Will Burn, I was frequently pulling up images from John Martin's paintings to help me stay in the right headspace. The imagery of his paintings really fit hand in glove with Emanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision that we are reading at the time as well as the themes of a biblical exodus and the horned Moses tradition that we were creatively gleaming from at the time. I really don't know if our album would have come out quite the same without his work as a reference. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how inspiration from his work may still color elements from our next couple records coming up as well. I really love that there is so much beauty and violence in John Martin's work. I love the sense of scale and depth in his work. The landscapes seem larger than life and have a sense of atmosphere, as though he painted in the dust or took into account the humidity in the landscape in his work. I love the sheer awe-inspiring destruction in some of his paintings. You see mountains turned over and crumbling. You see lightning coming from the ash of volcanoes. I really love how he paints light in his paintings, as though you were seeing it just coming through the cracks in the clouds. Really, I loved John Martin's work well before I knew his name. I saw his work in art books and would frequently come across it on the internet. I loved his style, but his name became set in stone for me as one of my all-time favorite artists when I first saw his work in person at the St. Louis Art Museum. Anyway, there it is. Um, it's really hard to put a finger on exactly what it is about someone's art that moves you the way it does. I don't know if you have a favorite artist or an artist that just inexplicably speaks to you. Um, and I'd love to hear about that. If you want to tell me in the comments what artists you admire or inspire you, um, go ahead and tell me. I'll, I'll try to look them up. But I guess that's it for today. Thank you for joining me. Um, if you like this video, please like, comment, share, subscribe. Also, Insomniac Folklore has a Patreon page, and it would mean a lot if you would join us there. It's really how we make this channel work. You can join up there for as little as a dollar a month um, and it goes up to different tiers we have a postcard club but anyway if you take a look at that that would be great and uh, thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next time thanks